Thank you, everyone. Hope everybody got to stretch a little bit, got some food, something to drink, got your energy back up. A um, couple of quick announcements. At the end of this session, at the end of this panel, um, there will be a reception at Barrett House. Um, there are a number of law students, BC law students who are here. Can folks raise their hands just to, we can get a quick sense of them? Okay, so we'll do that again at the end. But, uh, <laughs> right, and you'll be graded on that, right? Um, but they will be able to guide you over because trust me, if you haven't been here before, it'll take you a half an hour to find it. So. Um, we'll be going over, there'll be cocktails, hors d'oeuvres, it's lovely, and when you're there, um, many of the law students that are here, uh, also young lawyers who are here, both from the Boston area and from out of town, and I want to say a special thank you to my uh, peers from Maine who are here and drove two hours to attend this, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, uh, and I know others came from out of town as well. Uh, but talk to some of those folks. These are people who have an interest in our profession and maybe the future bankruptcy lawyers who will um, be practicing in our area, maybe members of the college someday. So, so take them under your wing a little bit, talk to some of the folks. I know it's fun to see some of your old friends, but, um, but take a few minutes to do that if you would. Um, okay, I get to do even less on this panel than I got to do on the last panel because we have my uh, former partner and good friend Kathy Stagey who will be serving as moderator of this panel, but let me introduce the panelists. First, at the far end, we have Roy Englert. He's a founding partner of Robbins, Russell, Englert, Orsec, uh, I can't even keep going, but lots of names. Um, and it's a litigation boutique in, in Washington, D.C. Um, he will be the first one to tell you that he's not a bankruptcy lawyer, but he has more than dabbled in it. Uh, he was just teaching co-teaching a class this morning on Stern v. Marshall, believe it or not. Um, so he gets to do it all day long. Um, he briefed and argued the winning position in Stern v. Marshall and Bank of America versus 203 North LaSalle, as you heard of both of those cases earlier. Um, and he worked on the Owens Corning litigation, which um, also dealt with third party releases and the like. Um, Danielle Spinelli, next to Roy, is Vice Chair of the Supreme Court and Appellate Litigation Group at Wilmer Hale in Washington, D.C. She has argued five cases before the Supreme Court, including uh, Jevic, uh, Bank of America v. Calquette, and Clark v. Uh, Ramaker. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, Ramaker, yep. maybe? Um, so she has a, a wealth of experience, um, both argue and she's briefed uh, many more cases than that before the Supreme Court. Um, next to my immediate right is Kathy Stagey. As I said, she is a partner at Jenner and & Block and co-head of the bankruptcy group. I started there in 1985. I think Kathy started in 1982, is that right? Um, and was one of my mentors and has been a friend now for 33 plus years. Um, and she argued successfully the wellness case before the Supreme Court. Um, and also uh, represented the petitioner in Law v. Siegel. Um, and last but not least, by any means, is Don Verrilli. Uh, if you're thinking, I've heard that name before, um, Don Verrilli served as Solicitor General of the United States from 2011 to 2016 under President Obama. Um, he was the su successful advocate in defense of the Affordable Care Act, marriage equality, and federal preemption authority in the immigration field. He's also served as Deputy White House Counsel, Associate Deputy Attorney General. Um, he's the, currently with Mung, Mung, is it Munger or Munger? Munger. Munger Toll and Olson, uh, the founder of its Washington, D.C. office. Um, and as we've kind of heard, um, we had a chuckle on the first call because he was formerly with Jenner and Block. Danielle Spinelli was a summer associate at Jenner and Block and worked with Don Verrilli, so we have a, a, a strong Jenner and Block connection here. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Kathy Staley. Well, so we've heard a lot about um, a lot of the issues that have been in front of the Supreme Court, but you'd be surprised to know that since the code was enacted in 1978, there's only been 84 cases 
that have been bankruptcy cases in the Supreme Court. And when you think about the number of bankruptcy cases that there are in the federal court system, one of the things that the dissenters pointed out in Stern, the large number of cases that uh, are bankruptcy cases, we've only accounted for less than 2% of what the court has heard in the last 40 years. So how do you get a bankruptcy case to the Supreme Court with those odds stacked against you? I mean, Supreme Court Rule 10A lists the reasons. Everyone knows that circuit split, conflict with an, on an important issue of federal law with a, a case of the Supreme Court, or the kind of catch-all, whatever the court thinks is important. So what do they think is important in the bankruptcy area? So <laughs> by and large, it's cases where one circuit has said, we reject the decision of you know, X and Y circuits and adopt the reasoning of Z circuit without much regard, in my view, for what, you know, for the importance of the issue. Um, and, you know, you know, and that probably stems from the fact that law clerks are, by and large, picking out the cases that the court takes and they tend to recommend grants in cases where there are clear, obvious splits of authority and where, you know, nobody, is going to be able to make a good argument that there's not a split of authority. That said, other cases do get to the Supreme Court. So Jevick, um, which, which Jamie was talking about, is an example. Um, there was a circuit split there, but it wasn't obvious. Um, you, you did not have, you didn't quite have the situation where one court of appeals said we're rejecting the reasoning of another court of appeals on the exact same issue. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, there, there was a split, and um, we were able to explain also, in part with some help from Amiki, that this was really a very important issue, notwithstanding you know, the language of the courts below that said this is a rare case, this is never going to happen, we were able to explain that this actually implicates some very fundamental principles of bankruptcy law. Um, so there are times when the nature of the issue does matter, but I think it matters largely where you don't have a really, really obvious circuit split. Does the court pay attention, or do the clerks pay attention to the impact of a case? I mean, I thought when we petitioned for wellness, and there was a question whether executive benefits would completely usurp the issues, that if the court was concerned about the, you know, the explosion that was going on in the bankruptcy courts of everyone all over the place in Stern, that they might take the case to try to settle things down, because it was really, a, you know, a difficult time for a lot of cases. So I, I don't know, you, you clerk, Don, you clerk, do, do they pay attention to any of that? So, I, you know, my take on that would be, if they screwed it up, <laughs> they're going to be feel more of a sense of responsibility to take a case to f clean it up or fix it. Um, whereas if they didn't, then they're going to be more likely to say, let's let this issue percolate and maybe things will work themselves out. Um, but I do think in this area of law, like many others, when the court issues an important ruling, especially one that has, a, you know, has the effect of bringing about a significant change in direction, there are, there are always going to be unanticipated consequences to something like that, and I do think that the court feels some sense of responsibility to deal with the, the consequences that have followed from what it's done. Now, not always, not invariably, not as soon as you'd like it, but I do think that that would weigh into the calculus. I've only had one bankruptcy cert petition granted ever, and that was 203 North LaSalle, and that was easy for a reason I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I had one considered at conference today with Jenner and Block and other firms on the other side, the Tribune bankruptcy case, and we'll see. They relisted it twice without action since Merrick the FTI, so we'll see. Uh, Bank of America v. 203 North LaSalle was easy for the following reason. The court had already taken the issue up once in a case called Bonner Mall that then settled. And Judge Jane Rastani of the Court of International Trade, sitting by designation on both the Second and the Fourth Circuits, had said that the Ninth and Seventh Circuits were wrong. And her opinion for the Second Circuit came out after the Seventh Circuit ruled in the 203 North LaSalle case, affirming Judge Weedoff. And she explicitly said for a unanimous panel of the Second Circuit that Judge Caney's dissent in the Seventh Circuit was right. So it was exactly as Danielle says, even the law clerks who don't know anything about bankruptcy see two courts expressly disagreeing with one another. 
and that makes it relatively easy to get cert granted. And it was a genuinely important issue, the, the absolute priority rule and the scope of the new value exception, scope and existence of a new value exception. The grant of cert in Bonner Mall, on the other hand, was very interesting. And it's a little bit of a labored story, but I'll try to tell it quickly. In Norwest Bank Worthington v. Ollers, the Solicitor General filed a brief saying there is no new value exception to the absolute priority rule. The court dropped a footnote leaving that issue open and asserting falsely that there was a split in the bankruptcy courts on the issue. All bankruptcy courts agreed that there was a new value exception based on case v. Los Angeles Lumber. But Bob Rasmussen and I had the audacity to write a brief that says the language of the code doesn't accommodate it. Everything changed in 1978. And by the way, case v. Los Angeles Lumber was dicta. After that footnote, which falsely said there was a split in the bankruptcy courts, a raging split in the bankruptcy courts developed, about 600 <laughs> cases. <laughs> and they were about 60%, 40% saying there is a new value exception. So 60% for 40% case v. Los Angeles Lumber dicta survived. The first court of appeals, well, the two courts of appeals resolved it before there was any split. The Fifth Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Edith Jones, emphatically said there is no new value exception. Mm -hmm. On rehearing, her two fellow panel members got cold feet and ruled the same way on different grounds. She wrote a dissenting opinion, or concurring in the judgment, on, deny, on grant of rehearing, comparing herself to Galileo when told that the, earth wrote, that the sun rotates around the earth instead of the other way around, said so under his breath, and yet it moves. The other court that decided the issue was the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in an opinion by Judge Stephen Reinhardt. An opinion by Judge Stephen Reinhardt is not in Supreme Court Rule 10, but perhaps it should be. <laughs> One of the best ways to get cert granted in the U.S. Supreme Court in the absence of a circuit split is to begin with the opinion below was written by Judge Stephen Reinhardt. And there's a reason for that. It's not, he's a very, very able man, extremely able man, but he openly says, I rule the way I think I should, regardless of what the Supreme Court thinks. And the Supreme Court is therefore on alert to rein him in. <laughs> and um, he said there was no, in the Bonner Mall case, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, in Bonner Mall itself, he said there is a new value exception. The Supreme Court granted certain the absence of the circuit conflict, but then it settled. So Danielle was exactly right. Mostly it's the circuit conflicts. That's why 203 North LaSalle was easy. But there are other interesting circuit grants. When you, when you pick your issue from a case, are you, should you focus just on one issue? Can you have a cert petition with four issues, two issues? Is there some magic to how you frame that issue to get their attention? The, sh the very short answer is you raise the fewest issues you can responsibly raise. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we represent clients, mm -hmm. and sometimes we have no choice but to raise big dollar issues that are tough cert issues alongside smaller dollar issues that might be easier cert issues. And so we sometimes are forced to take the risk of diluting our credibility by saying there's more than one cert where the issue in a case. And the Tribune petition that's pending now, there were three issues presented, one of which is the same as Merit v. FTI, and the other two of which are not, and they're interesting issues, but we, we felt that we should raise three issues in that in that particular petition. Yeah, sometimes you have to. It's not ideal. I mean, the, you know, what's ideal would be a single question that you can articulate in a single sentence <laughs> such that everyone can understand it. But that's not always the case you have. Yeah, and I just underscore in the agreement with my colleagues up here that sometimes you have to raise more than one. But I guess my takeaway would be it's really not ideal because the justices think the way they go about deciding cases when they grant them, a case is usually about one thing and they think about it that way and maybe it's about a second thing if it's relatively closely connected to the first thing but to the extent there's a real distance between the, the issues that you want them to consider in the same case that that's just not the way they usually do business and so it makes it harder to get your case in front of them if, if you are in a situation where you have to frame it with multiple issues. How does that process work? What do the clerks do when the cert petitions come in? Danielle, maybe um, the most recent clerk. It varies throughout the year. So I'm not a very recent clerk. I clerked during the 2000 <laughs> term. Well, you're maybe more <laughs> so recent than Don. No, that's Don. Way, way more recent. 
So um, you show up at the Supreme Court as a new clerk, and you're completely freaked out <laughs> about this job that you have. Your justice isn't there. Um, you show up in the summer, usually in July. Your justice isn't there because he or she is on summer vacation. And um, there are no arguments being held, so you don't have to get ready for arguments. So all you have are cert petitions. And so every week you get in your inbox a stack like that of all the cert petitions that have been assigned to you as a member of the cert pool. This is your experience if, you're a, if your justice is in the cert pool. And your job then is to write a memo about each one of these petitions that goes to every justice who is in the pool. Um, at the time that I did it, eight of the justices were in the pool. And so... And now it's seven. That's right. Now it's seven. Um, at the beginning of the year, you read these extremely carefully, you know, read the cases that they cite, think about them a lot, think about whether they're right, you know, th you know think about is this, is this really a split, is it not a split, you know, write a detailed memo that recommends deny. Um, a and detailed it, memo known as a flimsy? Yeah. <laughs> um, there are, we used to call them short forms. Um, when a case had obviously no merit, you could write a short form memo that was about half a page long. But when you first start, this is all you're doing, and so you spend all your time doing it. At, toward the end of the year, you do the same thing, except you spend far less time looking at them. And you know what you look for primarily is is there is there a split? Um, there are sometimes cases where you think it's wrong, um, and I recommended at least one grant in a case where there wasn't a split, but I thought it was just directly contradicted by Supreme Court precedent. Um, but typically, you're looking for splits. Yeah, and so something to pick up on what Danielle said. So therefore, when you're trying to get cert granted, it actually can make a difference when your petition mm -hmm. is considered. <coughs> you actually do not want your petition considered in that window of time that Danielle described when the law clerks have all just arrived and they're spending countless hours scrutinizing the petitions because not only are they spending all that time scrutinizing the petitions then, but there's this other phenomenon, which is that it's very embarrassing for a law clerk to write a pool memo recommending cert when there's some really good reason why it's not a worthy candidate for cert. It's an embarrassment. So that leads clerks at the beginning to often be quite risk averse. And so that is not when you want your petition considered, if you can help it. Right. The time when you want your petition considered is mm, December, January. <laughs> And the reason for that is because, you know, the court's docket is not very big anymore. And they get close sometimes to this kind of embarrassing position where they don't have enough cases to fill up the argument slots for the last couple of sessions. And so um, that you'll see that they'll grant <laughs> they'll borderline cases lenient. at that yes. time of year that you wouldn't expect them to grant. And that, I, I know. Who knows what's going on in their minds? But one explanation for that is that there is a situation where there's more pressure to put cases on the docket. And so, and this actually does, I mean, you can't have complete control over when you file a petition and have your petition considered. Um, but uh, it's may not I, May it's I not be a contrarian at this so, moment, yeah, Don? Go ahead. Um, if you've argued two or three North LaSalle and Sternby Marshall, you're always the skunk at the garden, garden party in a room full of bankruptcy <laughs> people. <laughs> But I'm going to be a contrarian about the Supreme Court's processes as well. Um, I think the timing that my colleagues do on cert petitions is silly and futile. <laughs> and one reason, one data point that suggests that it's silly and futile is that in a case called Stern versus Marshall, my co-counsel, I was not yet part of the legal team, rushed in their brief in opposition to make sure that the case went on to the long conference in September when there's usually the least chance of a grant. And guess what? The, the, what I think was genuinely an uncertworthy case as it came into the court, it left in a different package, but as it came into a court, an uncertworthy case was granted after being considered at the summer conference when it's supposed to be next to impossible to get cases granted. So that's one data point that has led me not to care very much about the timing of when the court considers cert petitions. 
Also about the cert pool, I'm going to use a very technical term, but I think the law students will get it better than the older people. The cert pool sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is groupthink at its worst, yeah. Yeah. and it's groupthink with skewed incentives because just as Danielle and Don, who clerked on the Supreme Court, which I did not, have said, the incentive for the clerks is always to recommend denial and not be embarrassed because the case goes into the garbage heap of history right. rather than recommend right. a grant and have someone later decide it wasn't cert worthy. So there's a, there's a skewed incentive. And what the court really ought to do is have two competing cert pools and harness the competitive energy of the law clerks <laughs> so that they will want to recommend grants and want to recommend denials and want yeah. to get it more right rather than have skewed incentives. Yeah, now yeah. back in the, in the old days when I clerked, I clerked for Justice Brennan, and um, he did not participate in the cert pool, nor did he have his law clerks work on the cert petitions. Aside from when you first arrived, the first couple of months you did them just so you got a feel for them, and because he was on Nantucket. But then uh, when he got back, he would just look at the petitions himself and kind of throw them in a pile, you know, throw most of them in a no pile and throw a few in a yes pile. So it was one thing you didn't have to do. But there was some benefit to having several justices, as was the case when I clerked, not be in the pool, which is sort of analogous to what, what Roy is talking about, because you, you, you're just going to get different judgments. And when the justices themselves are actually making the calls individually, you're going to get a more experienced and informed judgment about whether it's a case that ought to be on the dock. And if I may, one more thing on this topic. I can't recommend this book strongly enough. It was mentioned by Judge Gerber, uh, Ronald Mann's bankruptcy in the Supreme Court book. Whether or not you read this book, look in it far enough to find out about the database of the papers of the justices in every case under the Bankruptcy Code of 1978, as long as justices' papers are available, which goes up to about 95. Um, for example, in Norwest Bank, Worthington v. Aller is a case I worked on. The government recommended summary reversal. From this book and the accompanying database, I learned that the vote at conference was five votes for summary reversal and four votes for a plenary grant, and that resulted in a grant, not a summary reversal. I've been doing this stuff a long time. I never knew until I read that that five votes for summary reversal and four votes for a grant means a grant. Danielle, you mentioned that you had some help with Amakai at the um, cert petition stage. How, how, what, how, is it important to have Amicus briefs explaining the importance of an issue? So, I mean, conventional wisdom is that it's very helpful at the cert stage. I'm actually less sure of that than I used to be, just because there's been a sort of amicus brief arms race, <laughs> where now if, it, you know, any Supreme Court or appellate practitioner who files a cert petition believes that they have to have amici, and if you look hard enough, you can usually find somebody to say Except something. Except in Tribune. We have no amici in Tribune. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> there may be a reason for that, but... Um, <laughs> Um, Danielle's firm, I think, is yeah, on the other I know, side of it. Right? <laughs> I, I, was, I was very ably trounced by Phil Anker of Wilmer Dale in the second circuit. <laughs> so, but it can help if you have the right amici, if, if you're able to show, look, this is, this is an issue that has widespread implications. This is an issue that has the potential to cause a lot of turmoil in the securities markets, for example. Um, you know, if you're able to show that a lot of people care about the issue, it could potentially tip the balance. It's not going to save a case that's really not cert worthy, though. Does the United States ever come in and um, file amicus briefs at the cert stage when they're not party to the case? They just did that. So, yeah, for, so the way it usually works is that the United very, States very doesn't fair. come in unless it's invited in. Um, the, about 20 times or so a year, the court will ask for the views of the United States in a case when the government isn't participating. Um, and the, the, as Danielle said, they just filed an uninvited uh, brief at the cert stage and, su and support of cert, which is the first time in well over a decade, I think, that the United States did that. During my five years, we filed zero of those briefs. Um, and the reason you, you for... You don't count Reichel v. Howard? I don't remember Reichel. Okay. So maybe, maybe one that Roy remembers. But, um, but, you know, in general, the reason that the United States doesn't file those briefs is because of a concern that if it got into the habit of filing the briefs with any regularity, 
then the court would draw a negative inference from the fact that the United States didn't file a brief and that that's a problem because you don't want to be sending a false signal like that. And so as a result, there's an extremely strong thumb on the scale against filing uh, the United States filing amicus briefs at the search stage until the court asks. And as I said, the court asks like 20 times a year, so it's not like uh, the United States doesn't get to participate uh, at, at the search stage. Right, and in bankruptcy cases, the United States frequently has interests in, in multiple ways, but one way is as a creditor. And so, uh, you know, in... As an it's unsecured not, creditor almost always, isn't it? No. Well, no, no, very frequently as a secured okay. creditor. Um, so I proved I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. <laughs> but, I mean, of course, it, of course it can be either. But um, uh, so it's not, it's not at all uncommon for the court to, to see, it's called CVSG, call for the views of the Solicitor General in those cases. And if, if that happens, um, then you need to try to get the SG to agree with you <laughs> that your case is cert worthy. And... You know, they, they will politely listen to you and then decide on their own whether it is or isn't. Um, but if they say that it is, it certainly is extremely helpful. Don, Don was the Solicitor General, and there's no one better to give you inside baseball on how this process works within the government. So let me give you a little inside baseball on how this process works outside the government. Even though the government always says no, it often pays to advocate for an unsolicited amicus brief before the court invites it. And the reason is you get into not the SG's office so much, but you get into the underlying client agency early, and you start lobbying the agency to be on your side, so that if lightning strikes and there's a CBSG, or if cert is granted and the government has to decide which position to take at the merit stage, you've already got clients of OSG, Office of the Solicitor General, perhaps persuaded to your way of seeing the case. And I just went through this. I have a cert petition pending in a case under the F quad A, which is the trucking preemption statute. And we heavily lobbied the U.S. Department of Transportation to ask OSG to file an uninvited amicus brief. And it did ask. Guess what? No such brief. But we have laid groundwork, and we know already that the Department of Transportation will be on our side if the views of the Solicitor General are sought or if cert is granted. So it's been very valuable, very time consuming, very expensive, but very valuable groundwork asking for something that we knew was not going to happen. Yeah, and that, that raises a broader point that's, I, I think, worth focusing a second on, which is that, um, you know, the, the Solicitor General and the Solicitor General's office, it ultimately decides what the United States is going to say before the Supreme Court. But it's not a policy-making operation. It's reactive. It's basically going to make judgments based on the inputs that come from the parts of the executive branch of the government that do have a particular interest uh, in the issue in a particular case. And so, as, as Roy indicated, the really wise strategy is to get in and work, as, uh, at work to the extent you can with the parts of the government that are going to be providing the inputs to the SG's office as to what the position of the United States should be. That's where you can, in many ways, exert your most effective influence is there. You can exert the influence to, to, a, to a material extent in the SG's office itself, but it's really hugely important to do just what Roy said, to start with the components of the government that are going to have an interest and want to weigh in. So in the bankruptcy area, is that the U.S. trustee's office? Yeah. Do can, they have a lot of influence? Can be the U.S. Of trustees. It, it could be other agencies yeah. Yeah. as well. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it could be. It, they're. I mean, oftentimes they're intertwined with another issue, a labor issue or a tax issue. So there's a there's a wide variety of agencies that could be implicated. Yeah. Are there things that you could do with a cert petition that will take what's a nice, clean, <laughs> obvious split and hurt yourself and get your case not granted? Oh yes. And what are those things? <laughs> Um, they almost all fall in the category of overstatement. Mm -hmm. There are a variety of forms of overstatement, but claiming a bigger circuit split than you can really support when in fact you do have a clean circuit split is dangerous. Overstating the strength of your position on the merits can be dangerous because some justices who otherwise aren't that interested in the merits at the cert stage may get offended. Mm -hmm. um, Failing to stress the practical importance just because you have a circuit split is a very bad move. 
So that's not that's not an overstatement. That's an understatement point. But pretty much, it's pretty much a formula nowadays. It's developed through the years, but pretty much a formula. Every cert petition says there's a split. The decision below is wrong, and the issue is important. So you get your cert petition granted, and now you've got to write the brief. Do you write for particular justices? Do you? How do you? How do you frame your arguments? Do you think about that as you're drafting your arguments? Maybe in bankruptcy it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in bankruptcy. Do the ju justices even care about bankruptcy, seeing as how they only take so few cases? Let me tell you what my strategy is in a bankruptcy case as a non-bankruptcy person. My strategy in terms of writing the brief is always the same in every case, which is write for the court, not for individual justices. There are just too many surprises in the votes of individual justices to make it a winning strategy to try to write with a particular justice's vote in mind, either at the search stage or at the merit stage. But at the merit stage especially, mm -hmm. we think we know more than we do about, e even people have been doing this forever, think we know more than we do about what's going to motivate the justice's votes on the merits. The other thing I do the moment cert is granted is I find out which bankruptcy professors are likely to file an amicus brief supporting my position for a reason that came up in the first panel. The Supreme Court justices are generalists who don't know very much about bankruptcy. And they're self-aware enough to know that they may screw it up. So immediately, when cert is granted, sometimes before cert is granted, as in Owens Corning, which wasn't granted, I want bankruptcy, bankruptcy professors uh, Douglas Baird never signs an amicus brief, but I want other bankruptcy professors to sign a brief saying, this is actually right from the point of view of the experts. So do you want amicus briefs on the law or on the practicalities of them? I mean, sometimes you, you read maybe in other types of cases, death penalty cases, where you'll have psychologists talking about minors and things that are more of a scientific nature. You don't have that as much in bankruptcy, really. So, so the answer to your question is yes. Yeah, all of the it's above. not either or, yeah. it's all of the above. Yeah. yeah, and in terms of, you know, how, how you pitch your case, um, you know, my sense of that, um, similar to Roy's, but maybe a little bit different in that, you know, you'll hear, uh, you'll hear advocates, even very accomplished advocates, tell you, well, you ought to write the brief, and you ought to figure out in this case who your five votes are going to be, and you ought to write the brief focused on the person you think is going to be the fifth vote. Um, I don't think that's right at all, and, and I think that that, in fact, can cause offense um, because you're mm -hmm. telling some of the other justices that they're not particularly relevant to the decision in that case. Um, that said, you know, my sense of the uh, what of the way to be most effective is to write a brief that, is, as Roy said, contains a unitary argument from, from start to finish, but that has strands or strains in it that are going to uh, appeal to particular justices. For, you know, for mm -hmm. example, you know, in statutory construction cases, including bankruptcy statutory construction cases, I think, there are some justices who take great pride in saying, I'm just going to look at the words of the statute. I'm not going to factor in the consequences of adopting one rule versus another. There are other justices who focus maybe predominantly on the consequences of adopting one rule versus another. And so, you know, your brief's really got to you make a unified argument, and you should. But your brief really has got to write, it's got to have strains in it that are going to appeal to the justices who approach things in the different ways. And so finding a way to have a brief that's a harmonious whole while at the same time doing that. So that's sort of the way I think about it. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are certain cases where you do want to write your brief and make your argument to a particular person, but I think there are a particular justice, but I think there are a lot fewer than, than people maybe typically assume. Um, I worked on the juvenile death penalty case. That was a case in which the justices had ruled um, about a decade before that the juvenile death penalty was constitutional. Um, it got back up to the Supreme Court because the Missouri Supreme Court decided to leap ahead of the U.S. Supreme Court and say, no, it's not constitutional. So, of course, the state petitioned for cert, and of course it was granted. We, representing the death row inmate, knew that we needed to get either Justice Kennedy or Justice O'Connor to flip his or her vote. And so we wrote the brief for them. We ended up getting Justice Kennedy to flip his vote. Um, but that's, 
That will not happen in a bankruptcy case. I mean, it's very, very <laughs> unlikely that you're going to get a situation where you know enough about the views of the individual justices on a specific bankruptcy issue that it makes any sense at all to think, I'm going to pick my five and write for them. Um, and I mean, as Don is saying, there are ways to weave together strands that will appeal to different justices. Um, in a bankruptcy case, it, which typically is going to be a statutory interpretation case, you need to think a lot about the way the court approaches statutory interpretation and you need to put something together that is going to work for a coalition of justices. So it needs to be textualist and it needs to be purposivist. Um, and it, to me, the hardest, there are some things that are specific to bankruptcy cases that are, that are hard to do. One is that you have to convey a sense of, I, I think the textualist part is actually easier, the purposivist part, or what I sometimes think of as the structural part, in, in other words, the structure, the whole structure of the bankruptcy code points you toward this result, is hard because the justices don't have the instincts about bankruptcy that ba that bankruptcy practitioners do, and that's a that's a good thing in one way, for for someone who's in the court, and it's a bad thing in another way because they don't have a sense of how things should be. So you have to be able to explain the the structure and the purpose that lead to your answer in a convincing way, in a way that makes them think, you know, you know what you're talking about, you know how this is going to affect other areas of the bankruptcy code, and in a way that makes them care about it as well. And yet, in United Savings Association of Texas v. Timbers of Inwood Forest, a unanimous Supreme Court rejected the position taken by the United States as amicus curiae, and in a position by Justice Scalia, the court's leading textualist in its history, said statutory interpretation is a holistic endeavor, uh, an interpretation that may seem right in isolation, may not be compatible with the rest of the law. Now, that doesn't sound like Justice Scalia, but it was Justice Scalia, and there are important lessons there, and it was, a, it was a, an important bankruptcy case. Yeah, and you know, just picking up on that, the. It was really interesting, you know, when I, when, during my time as SG, I would try to be there whenever anybody from the office was arguing a case, and the at lawyers in the SG's office are arguing about 80% of the cases. So I, I saw almost every argument for five years. And normally, in most areas of law, particularly constitutional law, administrative law, statutory construction generally, the justices are supremely self-confident. Some would say maybe even overconfident, you know. They know exactly what they think and they know exactly why they think it, and they've thought it for a really long time. There are certain areas of law, and as a result, the oral arguments have a certain quality to them. They're more of like a jousting match kind of thing. There are certain areas of law, and bankruptcy is one of them. Patent law is another one. Um, I just observed over those five years, the tenor of the oral arguments is really different. The justices are much more in the mode of searching for, okay, how does this work? What's the right answer? Or am I going to screw things up if we take it this way as opposed to that way? There, it's, it, it's really interesting. They're much more in learning mode, I would mm -hmm. say, in a bankruptcy case and, and in patent cases and a couple of other areas like that because they lack in these areas the self-confidence that they have in most other areas. And so they, they're looking to rely on the advocates more, which I think makes it, especially important to focus on what Danielle was talking about in terms of making a convincing case about how the rule of law that you're advocating fits into the overall structure and operation of the act. And if, if I may say one more thing on this subject, um, read pages one to four of this book besides looking at the database. <laughs> Ronald Mann explains that when he was a law clerk to Justice Powell and gave the justice a recommendation on a bankruptcy case that he thought no one would care about, the nine justices, in fact, cared passionately about the case. And that actually gets to a larger point that I like to make whenever I'm speaking at a law school. Whatever you may think you know about the Supreme Court, take it from those of us who've appeared before the court for a long time. That's nine people trying fervently to get it right. They don't always get it right, but they are nine people fervently Absolutely. trying to get it right. And especially when I'm around law students who 
may not have all that much experience and may have a certain sample of Supreme Court cases and may have some professors who don't believe the Supreme Court tries to get it right. I think the most important service I can do is to say that I've been doing this for more than three decades and I firmly believe that about the current nine justices of the Supreme Court and about most justices who have, most justices who have ever sat on the Supreme Court. Yeah, you know, I, whenever, when I was SG, I would go, especially talking to lay audiences, and it's interesting, especially a few times when I spoke overseas, this, the basic thrust of the questioning is always, well, it's so political. It's all just politics. They all just line up politically. It's not, a, you know, but it's, a, it's actually, I felt this before I had the, the job as SG, but then again, spending those five years watching virtually everything they did, Roy's totally right about that. Um, the, you shouldn't be cynical about it. You just shouldn't be cynical about it. They are, they have different judicial philosophies they, which take them to different places, but they're all trying to apply those philosophies faithfully to try to come to the right answer. Uh, and, they, and they put an enormous amount of effort into it, and, and they are engaged in the enterprise that Roy described, I think. That's exactly right. Well, as someone who's had one argument there, I mean, I can say that when you're there and you have nine justices asking you questions, and at first you're obviously very nervous. Maybe you're not, Don, because you've been there oh, so no. many I times. I get more nervous with each one. But <laughs> Don Roberts <laughs> threw up before each of his 39 Supreme Court arguments. Yeah. Right, but... There is really definitely, I, I thought, and perhaps they do this, if they look up what your practice area is, maybe they knew I was a bankruptcy lawyer, but I felt like I got a lot of questions, particularly on the first issue that the dissenters talked about, whether what was going on there was a stern claim about how that would impact bankruptcy cases if bankruptcy judges couldn't decide what was property of the estate when the debtors got possession of it in his hot hands and is saying, well, it really belongs to somebody else, take me to district court, I'm not going to turn it over. And there really was, even though I knew that, um, you know, Justice Roberts was not going to be on my side on consent, that was very clear from, from Stern. He wrote it, I think, trying to inch toward the way that there would be no consent. Um, you know, there was just genuine, you could see that they really were trying to get to the right result. And as a result, a after a few minutes, it's just like arguing in really any court. Um, and you're just answering the questions and... Um, it's a, it's a much more civilized process than perhaps arguing in the Seventh Circuit in front of Justice Judge Easterbrook. Easterbrook. <laughs> we just did that for Rips the first time. Yeah. Shreds yeah. when he doesn't agree with you yeah. and doesn't want to hear anything you have to say, even if they're, you, even if ultimately they didn't agree on a particular point, they were listening to what you had to say and trying to get it right. Which leads to a question: Should experienced Supreme Court practitioners always do these arguments? Should <laughs> folks like me stumble in once in a while and do an argument? What, what is really Well, the... folks like you, if they're truly <laughs> like you, should stumble in and do yeah. arguments. It, yeah. it, it's, there, are, there are rookies and there are rookies. <clears throat> okay. um, it is not absolutely necessary in every case to have an experienced Supreme Court practitioner. I have seen stunningly brilliant arguments by first-timers, and often by first-timers who were never going to be there again. Stunningly brilliant. And I've seen very experienced Supreme Court advocates lay an egg. So it's not necessary in every case. But think about it in every case before you make your judgment. Because there are a lot of advantages that we have that are not because we're smarter, just because we appear before the same people over and over and we have more familiarity with how they work. Right. I mean, I think ideally, I, you know, I suppose the person you would want is someone who is, you know, both an experienced Supreme Court advocate and knows a fair amount about bankruptcy. But I think of those two, the more important thing is to get someone who, who either is an experienced Supreme Court advocate or who is a terrific advocate who's going to get some guidance along the way from people who have a lot of Supreme Court experience because it, it's just essential to know your audience. It's, you have to know the issue, but you also have to know the audience. And if you know the issue but not the audience, you're not going to get what you want. An anecdote um, has nothing to do with bankruptcy, but it follows up on Danielle's point. I was hired by the state of Alaska, and my, the checks paying our fees were signed by Sarah Palin, to 
defend the proposition that there is no constitutional right to DNA testing to establish actual innocence. Interesting and difficult issue, but um, uh, obvious implications if you get, if you imprison innocent people or let them stay in prison, but some systemic implications if you call it a constitutional right too. So it's a difficult issue, and it was made clear at the outset that even though I'd argued a criminal case for the Commonwealth of Kentucky the term before directly yeah. against Don, yeah. that I was not going and to be arguing. And you won 9 nothing, I think. 17. So, so. 17. Yeah. Uh, I was not going to be arguing this, this case for which the state of Alaska hired me. Someone from the state AG's office was going to argue it. So my role was to build him up and get him ready, and that was great. I enjoyed it. The morning of argument, I always tell my co-counsel to meet in the Supreme Court cafeteria. It's just good to get in the building early. You have access. It's on the lowest floor. Good to have a cup of coffee and whatever else you consume in the morning and just chill inside the building. He was late. The guy who was arguing was late the day of the uh, Osborne argument. And when he got there, I said, how are you? And he said, terrible. And I said, why? He said, because I'm arguing a case in the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the argument, he said, wow, that was great. I can't wait to do it again. <laughs> Yes, that is exactly what it's like. <laughs> but there's such a process too. When you when you get there, you go to that um, briefing, that room where they you know tell you everything that's going to happen, where you're going to sit, what you're going to do, what you can walk in with, what you can't, you know. And in in the case that I had, even though we were the petitioner, we didn't sit on the petitioner side because the solicitor general was on our side. And, how you move when the Solicitor General comes over to, to make his argument. And that does kind of, all those things do kind of help a little bit. It, help, it helps, it down helps a lot, bit. actually. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the last time I was there for an argument, you know, the clerk said to me, well, you, you, know, you know how to do this, so I don't need to give you this spiel. And I said, oh, no, I'd like to hear it, because it's, yeah. co it's comforting, <laughs> comforting <yeah>. you know? <laughs> and, I, you know, I could forget what I know at any moment out of sheer terror, so. This is another non-bankruptcy point, but I think it's interesting. I'll make it succinctly. Most clerk's offices around the country exist to protect the judges from the lawyers outside the building. That's what they see their mission as being, is getting things yeah. to the judges in the form they want and telling outside counsel that they're not doing what the judges want. Mm -hmm. Totally different yeah. in the Supreme Court of the United yeah. States. The clerk and the chief deputy clerk and most of the clerk's office feel that it is their job to help counsel to deal with the court. Yeah, and they, they they, it, it's much the same thing. They're trying to let you do what the justices want, but they present it in a way of let us help you instead of you're screwing up. <laughs> What are each of your um, horror stories, war stories, whatever, of things that have happened in arguments that took you by surprise, and how did you handle it? Well, I'll start. Um, I argued a copyright case. Actually, the same day I was hired to do Stern v. Marshall, I argued a copyright case in the Supreme Court, only copyright case I've ever argued anywhere. And I had done some, again, actually, it was a position that we had gotten cert granted on over the solicitor, over Elena, Solicitor General Kagan's opposition on an issue in which there was no written opinion anywhere in the land agreeing with our position, <laughs> including the district judge's ruling in our case that had been reversed by the Ninth Circuit, which had been an unelaborated ruling in our favor, just announcing the result with no explanation. And we got cert granted, even though the SG said it's uncertain where the end were wrong. And it's its own special phenomenon to go before the Supreme Court and ask it to rule in a way that no other court has ever ruled in a written opinion. And I did multiple moot courts for that argument, and I was beaten up mercilessly, as I should have been. That's what moot courts are good for. Make it easy, comparatively, when you get to the real argument, because your moot court judges are so hard on you. And I was beaten up mercilessly, and I went to the real argument. And the only, and I knew Justice Breyer was going to be my most favorable justice. What I didn't know was that the only thing he was ever going to ask me was why my position didn't go further. <laughs> and there was a reason my position didn't go further, which was there were dicta in a unanimous opinion that seemed to be difficult for me, and I tried to gerrymander my position, so to speak, so that it accommodated those dicta, but also stated a favorable rule of law. Without those dicta, it would have been possible to state a much cleaner rule of law, and that was the thrust of what Justice Breyer was asking me, was why aren't you stating the cleaner rule of law? And I responded in argument, 
because of legislative history and dicta, which led Justice Scalia to say, that's the end of the case for me. But you see, what I was saying was that my concessions were driven by legislative history and dicta, not that my whole position was driven by legislative history and dicta. But I lost that case, four to four. Uh, got the decision while I was in Hawaii on vacation in which someone actually proposed marriage to me. Um, and then I had Stern v. Marshall to argue. Interesting time in my life. <laughs> So I, uh, yeah, but but oops, just to, sorry, just to complete the story. Oh, <laughs> no, it's not over yet. <laughs> Eventually, the Supreme Court ruled six to three that our position had been right all along, because it was more cleanly presented in the Kurtzang case by Josh Rosencrantz, and he got, among other things, he got Solicitor General, he got Justice Kagan to say that Solicitor General Kagan had been wrong. Yeah. It's <laughs> quite an accomplishment. So my, um, the second case I argued in the Supreme Court long, was a long time ago, long before I went into the government. Um, it was a death penalty case, and it was on behalf of a guy named Larry Lonchar, uh, who was a complete lunatic. Um, and he, he had this little game that he played uh, where he would uh, say to the authorities in Georgia where he was on death row, I want to be executed. I don't want any more appeals. I want to be executed. And so they ramp up the machinery and you know, schedule an execution, and the execution date would be... Uh, soon, and then he would say, "I changed my mind." He sounds <laughs> and he would, like a fun guy. And he would, and he would file a uh, he would file a habeas petition, and he had, did, hadn't had any habeas corpus relief or consideration. He had been tried, convicted, <laughs> sentenced to death, but no habeas. So he would file a habeas petition, and so the state would stand down the execution. Then he withdraw the habeas petition, and he would tell the state again, "I want to be executed." And they would say, you sure? And he'd say, he'd say, yes. They'd start the machinery up again, and he would file another habeas petition. And so he did this three times. And on the fourth time, not entirely surprisingly, um, the, so he did this three times, and then he filed the habeas petition the fourth time, and the federal courts, it was the 11th Circuit, said, here's the thing, no. We're tired of this. We're not doing this anymore. Yes, there's a rule that generally everybody gets a, one ruling on habeas corpus before an execution, but not you because of your abuse of the writ. So I got asked to take this case on after it had been granted, and I agreed to do it. And um, the, the reason that uh, Mr. Lanchard gave for his behavior was that he did actually want to be executed but he wanted to be executed, he didn't want to be electrocuted because he wanted to donate his liver to Irma Bombach, who at that point in time was in need of a liver transplant. And if he was electrocuted, he wouldn't be able to do that, wouldn't be much left of the organ. But if he were uh, killed through lethal injection, which the state was considering, then he might be able to donate his organ. So anyway, um, the, the Supreme Court granted cert to decide this question of whether uh, you, you get, you basically have a right to one full habeas consideration or whether you can forfeit it through abusive behavior. And so, uh, you know, this, so this was basically a long way of saying this thing was bad enough by the time um, oral argument came along. <laughs> and we had a good principled argument that you, everybody gets one habeas and that the doctrine of abuse of the writ only applies to successive habeas petitions, not to your first one, so it couldn't be abuse. And so the worst set of facts imaginable, I thought, until the morning of argument. Uh, and so I'm sitting in my office, gathering my things, getting ready to go to the Supreme Court, and one of my colleagues walks in uh, with a copy of the Washington Times newspaper. And he drops it on my desk and says, you should look at this before you go to court this morning. And there is an article on the front page of the Washington Times saying, uh, Larry Lonchar's lawyer representing him over his objections. <laughs> and there was a long article in which Larry Lonchar was quoted, uh, along with uh, a lawyer he had had uh, in the lower courts who was a, also pro bono counsel for the Hemlock Society, as it turned out. Um, <laughs> quotes, I, I kid you not, I'm not making this up. Quotes from both of them. You can find it. It says, I think this was like December of 1974 or 1975. I forget which year, one or the other. 1994, 95, rather, in which this article appears. Saying that, you know, uh, Don Verrilli, private practitioner, blah, 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 
purports to be representing him, but he has said he doesn't want his case to go forward in the Supreme Court. And so, uh, so on my way in, I had to sort of figure out what I was going to say about this. Uh, and you know, fortunately, I had a letter in my files authorizing the representation. And so, um, and uh, so anyway, I got to the argument, and I just decided, well, I wasn't going to say anything until they asked me. And I did the argument. And I didn't say anything until they asked me. And at the very, very end of my argument, Justice Breyer, uh, actually it was, it was the end of my, yeah, it was the end of my argument. Justice Breyer asked a question at the very, very end, after all the back and forth. And it was a very heated argument, as you might imagine. Um, and, and he said, so you are representing this man, right? <laughs> but it was like there was no time left on the clock, so I could say, yes, I am, thank you, and I sat down. <laughs> and, I like, and we actually won the case, 5-4, <laughs> amazingly enough. So. And whatever happened to him? Uh, he, he was subsequently executed. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you want to tell a story, Daniel? Yes. <laughs> I don't have a story like that. I mean, I, I, I can't really think of a situation where I've been substantively surprised by anything I've been asked, that, which is not to say I have never stumbled in an argument, because that happens multiple times in every argument. And I, I mean, there are different things that can sort of throw you off balance, even if you have, you know, anticipated the the general area in which the question is going to be asked. I mean, one is to be asked things in a very hostile tone. I find that can sometimes be unexpected and hard to deal with. And um, I have I have certainly had some hemming and hawing in transcripts after that kind of question. Um, but by and large, because of the way that you prepare for these arguments, it's unlikely that you're going to get a question that comes completely out of left field. So, I mean, the way I do it, and I work with Seth Waxman, who is also a former Solicitor General, and I basically do it the way he does it, is, you know, to to spend some time sitting down and writing out every question you can think of that you might be asked, and then writing an answer. Um, and, and doing several moot courts, um, after which if any questions come up that you haven't already thought of, you add those to your list. And so ideally when you get there, you know, you have pretty much anticipated the possible universe of things, you know, barring something happening, happening the morning of the argument, <laughs> to you know, to change what you need to say, um, but you know, which is not to say that it's necessarily easy to to deal with these things on your feet. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Danielle and Craig Goldblatt and Brian Fletcher, who was an associate at Wilmer at the time, and I believe is now in the SG's office right. on Stern v. Marshall and with another very fine lawyer named Eric Brunstad, uh, who taught bankruptcy law at Yale for many years. And my style of preparation is quite different from Seth Waxman's style. But there was a tricky question about Langenkamp v. Culp that came up as we were preparing for argument. And I sent a one-sentence email, I think, asking how people thought I should deal with this. And I got back a six-page email from Brian Fletcher. <laughs> yeah, that's Brian. That's, that's Brian, Brian, yes. Yeah. That was very good. Brian was right, too. Yeah, he usually is. Usually is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've never worked with Seth Waxman, but that is exactly what I did after I would I wrote out a lot of questions, and particularly there's a moot court that you can do at Georgetown if you're the first person who asks, and if both people ask on the same day, they flip a coin or something. And anyhow, I got to do the moot court there, and the person who was like the chief justice of the moot court um, was really focused on this idea, again, on the first, issue that we had, what was a stern claim, about what did it mean to be in possession of property. And he asked me, like, well, if the key is in a shoebox under the kid's bed and it's the father's property, is that in possession and, and all these variables of that? And I went back that night to the office and sat there and wrote out every question, every conceivable answer. I've got not one question anything like that, but it was a comforting thing to do, um, to know you were covered. 
this, this is an ironic question to ask, but have you ever been asked a question that you honestly just couldn't understand? Oh, yes. I've sure. read enough transcripts to sure. find myself in the position of saying, I'd have no idea what this question was, not what the answer was, but what the question was. It happens all the time, and I'd it usually ask comes from. I've like that, too, so I'm just curious whether you <laughs> traveled that happened and, and how you responded to it. Yeah, so it happens all the time, and it usually comes from Justice Breyer. <laughs> so, um, and I clerked for Justice Breyer, um, and I love him dearly. Um, but his questions can sometimes be pretty hard to follow. So, you know, you need to try and divine, <laughs> what, you know, what what concern is driving his question and and address it. And if you get something you really just don't understand, then, you know, you may want to answer it quickly and move on. Oh, no, 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 no. If you really don't understand it, say, I don't understand the question, Your Honor. Or yeah. say, if I understand your question correctly, that's then. That's the way to do it, is to, re, is to restate it. What, what do you do if you get in executive benefits when that was argued? I, I think it was Justice Barton, it might have been Justice Scalia, started asking this question about, remember the argument about the, the hole in the statute and mm -hmm what the bankruptcy judge could or could not do with an unconstitutional core claim. And I think it was Scalia positive, well, what if we've gone to the diner and we've asked for ham and eggs, but they only give us the eggs? What, you know, isn't that what the bankruptcy judge is doing if he only gives proposed findings? And then it launched into <laughs> what seemed to take up of John Pato's argument, like seven, eight, ten minutes of this, like, stupid stuff about different things you could not get on your breakfast menu. So how do you stop that? I mean, how do you get back to what you want? I mean, if you read the transcript, you'll see it. It's like, it doesn't even make any sense, really. If you read the argument transcript from you, Sutton v. United Airlines, which is obviously a non-bankruptcy case, it's an American Disabilities Act case that, that I had the privilege of arguing in uh, April of 99, You'll see there's two consecutive pages in which I don't get a word in that choice. The justices are just talking over each other. And I responded by bringing up the example of Doug Flutie, the short quarterback from, I believe, this very institution. And there was a method to my madness. I had to reassert control of the argument by bringing up something that would make them stop and listen. <laughs> and it was not an irrelevant thing. The case involved the question whether what, what does it mean for someone to be perceived as disabled? And in the brief, I used the example of Ted Williams versus other people with worse eyesight and picking Ted Williams over someone with worse eyesight, which obviously is not saying the other person is disabled, it's just saying the excellence of the physical characteristic matters for this particular job. And I had in mind sports examples, and I didn't think of Doug Flutie until the morning of argument. But I sat down with my co-counsel, uh, Miriam Nemitz, and I said, will this make sense if I say it in oral argument? And she said, as long as you explain who Doug Flutie is and why you're saying it, because those of us who aren't sports fans won't get it immediately. So the way to say it was as I was advised by Miriam, but the first words to say to get their attention were Doug Flutie, because that was the way to get them to stop talking only to each other and to listen to me. Yeah, and it's really interesting. You know, we were. Uh, earlier this year working with a, a very accomplished lawyer who had not argued a case in the Supreme Court before and trying to help get the lawyer ready. And one thing we did, we picked out like half a dozen oral arguments in contentious cases uh, to send the lawyer to, you know, send the links to the audio so the lawyers could listen to them. And we also did a statistical analysis of the arguments. And in those arguments, the justices spoke for an average of 57% of the time. Mm -hmm. right? So in other words, the justices are speaking more than the advocates in these contentious cases. Um, and, then the, and then we also, I think the average length of answer in these uh, was like 23 seconds, something like that. And so it was really quite amazing when you actually just looked at it. It's sort of something that all of us and anybody who's argued in the court understands you know, viscerally, that that's what it's like. But when you actually look at the the raw numbers and you see, actually, they speak most of the time. There were only like in, in one of those, one of the six we picked out, I think there were only four times in 30 minutes when the lawyer got to speak for more than 45 seconds straight. Um, so it just sort of gives you some sense of uh, what it's like. And bankruptcy cases do tend to be a little different because as 
you know, as I think Roy and Don both said, the justices are not bankruptcy experts, but they want to get it right. And so a lot more of the questions that you get in those arguments will be genuine questions. Um, how does this work? You know, how, what, it, what is the intent behind this particular statutory provision that I don't understand? Um, and yes, you want to keep control of the argument in the sense that you want to get your basic points out, but what you really want to do is resolve any doubts that they might be having about your position. And so, you know, at, we, at least in my view, it's more important to take advantage of those opportunities and get them comfortable with your position and get them comfortable with you because if you can explain things to them, they're more likely to believe that you're right. Um, I forget which great advocate it was who said it. Maybe it was John W. Davis. Rejoice when the court asks questions. Yes. Oh, no, the worst. I mean, you can have situations where I have seen arguments where the advocate talks for most of the time and gets very few questions. It's either, typically it's because the justices have given up on the advocate and just don't think they're going to get anything helpful. And so you, or it could be the opposite where it's just so obvious that the person wins that it's not necessary to ask questions, but that's not the situation you want to be in. I, I left the government in 89 and I worked on a case argued in the spring of 89 by a lawyer who shall remain nameless. Um, and our only hope of winning the case for the government was to expand on a theory Judge Anthony Kennedy, when he was on the Ninth Circuit, had adopted in an opinion of the Ninth Circuit. And one of the first questions in the oral argument came from Justice Kennedy, and he said, are you saying that, and then he laid out the same theory as his Ninth Circuit opinion. And the advocate's answer was, well, I'll get to that, but if you'll just let me finish what I was saying. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> How important is the first, one of the things I did before I prepared what I was going to say in wellness was look at a lot of arguments and it seemed like when you read the transcripts, people got a page maybe to say before the first question came in. So maybe two, three sentences tops. And so I spent a lot of time on those two or three sentences. How important is it as to what you pick to open with? I think it's very important. Um, but. I mean, because it may be the only thing that you get to say of your own accord. And so you don't want to spend time throat clearing or telling them about the facts or what kind of case it is. You just want to say the one thing you want them to, to take away. And it can, it, I know, it can sometimes take a lot of time to refine that and figure out what, what it in fact is. On November 2nd, 1998, I opened an argument by telling the court about the facts, which I thought were very compelling for my side. But because it was in a specialized area of law, I thought these generalist judges wouldn't understand how compelling the facts were for my side unless I laid them out in a particular way. And it went over like a lead balloon. And I was asked to re-argue the case in May of that year in Sacramento before the California Bankruptcy Institute. This is 203 North LaSalle. I was asked to re-argue the case, and I decided I would open at the mock argument the same way I'd open at the real argument. And I got the question afterward, why did you open that way? Conventional wisdom is don't start with the facts, because they get those from the briefs. And I said, well, I thought the cat, I, I had a reason, but it went over like, like a lead balloon, and the reason I repeated it here is just to, just to use it for an advocacy lesson for you and for me. Yeah, so, you know, we thought in the SG's office that the average time you get for an opening is about 45 seconds. It conforms to what you're saying, okay? That normal human cadence is approximately 120 words per minute, so 90 words. Um, so at least that's what I do. I try to have an opening that is no longer than 90 words. I try to say something that matters. Um, that can be an, an anchor or safe place to be um, for the reason that Danielle said that's a, you know it's your one chance to get it you may be your only chance to get it out there on your own terms stated affirmatively and even then though you don't even always get the 45 seconds particularly if you're a respondent um, you can sometimes have 
or if you, the, mis the mistake one can make, and I've made it innumerable times, is you can say something in those first 90 words that triggers a hostile response from a justice who will jump in and interrupt you. So you have to, when you're crafting it, you want to yeah. try very, very hard not to do that so you can at least get your 90 words out. Um, and, um, but even if you don't get your 90 words out or however many words you have, if you have that in your head, you'll find some time during the argument when you get it out. Um, so it's an incredibly valuable thing to do even if you don't actually get to deliver it right at the beginning because you have figured out how to distill some incredibly important thing about the case. And you try to get it out at the beginning, and if not, you pop it out later when you can. So if I may, I, I have a point about, I have a story about Don Barilli and a general <laughs> point about oral argument. Uh, Don is a brilliant oral advocate, and he has many spectacular performances in oral argument, but none is better than his argument in the health care case, the Obamacare case. Um, he correctly anticipated everything he needed to anticipate about that case, including how much emphasis he should put on the argument that the individual mandate was actually a tax and should be upheld on that ground regardless of the Commerce Clause analysis. He cleared his throat and took a drink of water at the start of the argument, and the case was so politicized, and it was same-day audio, that there were radio and television ads attacking Don personally for stumbling at the start of his argument and quoting him clearing his throat, and playing the sound of him clearing his throat and drinking water. And it's just an example, it's, it's the extreme example I know of, but it's an example of what a misleading view of Supreme Court advocacy you can get from little tiny snippets that are politicized by the people who use them. Because it was a, it was a tour de force argument, his, advocate, his adversary, Paul Clement, is the, the best in the business. Uh, it was a brilliantly argued case on both sides, and, but Don was the better and the prevailing advocate. Yeah, but I didn't make good use of the first 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but that gets to the more general point, which is oral argument doesn't matter that much. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Does it matter? Yes. Emphatic yes. Does it matter that much? No. The stats I've always used are I think one in ten cases is changed in the outcome of oral argument, but of those one in ten, nine in ten are lost in oral argument, and one in ten is won in oral argument. You can change a loser into a winner about one case out of every hundred, but you can change a winner into a loser about nine cases out of every hundred, and most times you, there's nothing you can do to change the outcome. Although I bet bankruptcy cases are going to be in the category where it's more likely than that you could have an effect because of the insecurity and uncertainty of the justices and that that uh, it does seem to me an area in which the justice could come a justice could come in with just a misperception about the way things work and, the, and an effective advocate can sort of figure out that the justice is out of alignment and get the justice into the proper alignment and understand how things work and and maybe make a difference in the way that justice sees the outcome of the case. Can I follow up on that? And it's a thread that came up a couple of times earlier. Lawyers and law students are taught not to make arguments based on stuff that isn't in the record. And yet you have judges, uh, justices, excuse me, who are asking questions that cry out for that kind of stuff. Uh, I assume that if they ask the question, we can bend or break that rule, do you go pre a proactive on it, or uh, do you figure you'll, you'll just do it, or how do you balance that tension? <laughs> so I, I, I have seen, again, this my, my like five years of watching this up close was really great. I saw more than one lawyer, and they were all male, so I'll say his, more than one lawyer get his head torn off for relying on something that wasn't in the record without saying, well, you know, Your Honor, that's not in the record. Some, that's not one way lawyers handle it to diffuse that problem. So, you know, it's not in the record. There's nothing in the record about that. Um, I do have a sense of what the answer is. Do you want to hear it? And then that, at that point, the justice will either say yes or no. If it's on the record, I don't want to know. Sometimes there will be information that's not in the record, but that is in an amicus brief, and that is responsibly sourced so you could rely on it and an advocate could point to the amicus brief, you know, in that sort of situation. Um, but uh, but 
you act at your peril, I think, to make it, to say something that's about to talk about something that's not on the record without having first let them know. Judge Gerber, there were some fireworks among the justices this week at oral argument over that exact topic. The justices criticized each other for asking questions about things not in the record. That said, I mean, you will get those questions, especially from certain justices. Um, and the Supreme Court is less stringent in enforcing that rule than any other court. And part of it is because they do have this tra you know, tradition of Brandeis briefs where um, amici will come in and give empirical data relevant to the question. Typically, none of that is in the record, and yet the court considers it and relies on it. Um, and you know, there have been some cases where that practice has been questioned by some of the justices. Um, the juvenile death penalty case was actually one of them, but and you know, but they have they have continued to do that. Judge Posner has a book, How Judges Think. And I'm not overall a big fan of the book because I think the correct title is How I Think. <laughs> <laughs> but it has some important nuggets. And one of them is there's a difference between legislative facts and adjudicative facts. If you're going outside the record on the facts of your case, even at the Supreme Court level, that's a pretty yeah, big no-no. Yeah. But if you're going outside the record to say things that have to do with uh, matters of empirical data about large questions, not discrete questions in your case, but large questions, like does separate but equal really mean equal, um, that has an honorable and honored tradition in our law, whether you think of the Brandeis brief, you think of Brown v. Board of Education, or you think of some more recent cases, that the, the juvenile death penalty case, in which they relied on social science research, not in the record. We just have a few minutes. Do folks have questions for... How important do you think the, um, what I'll call the implications arguments are? In other words, if you have a bankruptcy case, how important is it to talk about how it will or will not have impacts sort of outside the bankruptcy universe? And do the justices care about that? Uh, that gets us back to Butner v. United States. <laughs> the the a big theme of Supreme Court bankruptcy jurisprudence is that non-bankruptcy law matters in bankruptcy cases, and they are often very interested in their implications for areas outside of bankruptcy. They're also often very interested in the implications of a particular interpretation of the code, and this is, as we've been saying in several different ways, this is when they really want help from the advocates. They're not just there to toy with the advocates. They really want help with regard to what the implications of a position are. And in all cases, one argues in the Supreme Court, they want to know the limitations of your theory. That's always one of the most important things about arguing a case there. Um, any, I want to point out something. There's, a, there's an interesting comment right at the beginning with Roy. I, I, I think I both agree and disagree. Um, there are a number of comments from the court that have been made, and, and I have I pulled a couple of them here, about the court's views about bankruptcy. Um, and some of the justices have been quite um, forthright in the fact that they don't know a lot about it. Um, some of them have been forthright that they don't care a lot about it as well. Um, and that it's more important, for example, that they provide a clear answer than that they provide a right answer. Um, in statutory cases. Yes. Some because of Congress can fix it. Yeah, because, and that's one of the reasons, because they figure if they get it wrong, it's not, you know, a, a death penalty case, whatever. Congress can fix it if we get it wrong. So um, I, I, I think that there, there may be a little bit less concern. Um, I, I, in the Commodity Futures Trading Commission case versus Weintraub, uh, Justice Powell wrote, this is not an area of the law in which I have any expertise or any great interest. <laughs> the, the issue is hardly one of national importance, close quote. Um, and th there are a number of quotes like that. But I do think that, that that does not mean that they don't take their job seriously and want to get it right in the sense of coming up with an answer that will be applied and able to be applied consistently and not disrupt the system. And it might be 
why the Chief Justice in Stern v. Marshall said, well, this is a very narrow holding because he didn't want to disrupt the whole system. So I, I, I think it's very interesting. Um, more questions, because we have some people here that you probably won't get to ask things of very often. Roy, following up on a question, on a point that you made, the Doug Flutie uh, example that you gave, in that argument, uh, I think that was the one where you said that um, if you read the transcript that the, the justices go on for a couple of pages and they're talking to each other and not talking to you at all. Um, it, isn't that really a great thing? I mean, aren't you learning from them when they're talking to each other? Uh, yes, up to a point. But on, on the premise that oral advocacy sometimes matters, one has to learn for a while and then assert for a while. Uh, there's a certain amount of time that one is happy to learn more about what the justices think, but then that learning has to be turned into some kind of advocacy, uh, because otherwise you're just passively sitting and waiting for the opinion. Yeah, you want them to think you have something important to contribute. You know, to, now, to what they care about. You want, you want to contribute something important to what they care about, and so that's why your point's well taken. You want to know what's, what they're really focused on, what you want to contribute to. It was also a case in which I could have lost on either of two grounds, and I hadn't yet talked about the second ground. Last night at dinner, I happened to have mentioned uh, to the folks who we were dining with that um, I had won a case in the district court in Chicago that I never should have won. It had to deal with assignment of rents under Illinois law, and I got a ruling that just bucked 100 years of law. <laughs> it was a terrible decision, and I'm not sure how I got it. And the bank said, we have to appeal this. We, you know, and all the banks were involved and up in arms. And my panel was um, Easterbrook, Posner, and someone else who I don't remember. Um, and I, they just yelled at me for 20 minutes. I mean, I really didn't get a word in edgewise. Um, so, it, it, but... You know, you kind of wonder why they're there. I get the sense from what you're all saying, though, that in the bankruptcy arena, that you've all shared, you all shared the view that that they really are there to listen and learn and try to find out the ramifications of, you know, the decision that they might make and and why the bankruptcy law should be construed a certain way. I would say, as someone who's argued a lot in the Seventh Circuit and has had panels with Easterbrook and Posner, the argument before mine uh, in wellness, the gentleman who was arguing was getting a lot of, it was an uh, immigrant rights case, whether someone could be deported for, for drug conviction, what he had, like pills in a sock or something. And he was getting <coughs> questions from uh, Alito and Scalia where he was agreeing with them and then they kept telling him he was going to lose. And then Kagan came in and Justice Kagan came in and said, no, you're agreeing too quickly. And she started making the arguments for him. But I have to say, if this had been in the Seventh Circuit, there would have been such a different tone to it. It was actually pretty civil, and then he eventually got his sea legs and started making his argument. As I understand it, he won the case. But it's just a different, they are very civil, I think, I, you know, in comparison to what we're used to in the Seventh Circuit anyway. Yeah, well, that's not the right standard. But it makes you tough. <laughs> they can be very incivil at times, yeah. but they are always setting nationwide precedents. And they are always aware that they are setting nationwide precedents, and they don't want to set a bad nationwide precedent just because there's a bad lawyer. Mm -hmm. And that's one of yeah. many reasons why they'll, why they'll sometimes jump in and help. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dan. <coughs> you just have to speak loud. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm just intrigued by this idea that you have a nine times greater chance. Losing the case through oral argument than you do uh, than you do um, of winning it, um, and, uh, and 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 especially when you say that you may have the opportunity to just stand there for a few minutes and let them talk. I mean that would be one strategy of minimizing your chance of losing the argument. But <laughs> but um, but I am, but I am just wondering whether there are any generalizations that one could make about what not to do in the sense of you know how how not to utilize oral argument. Uh, as a way to lose. Well, I already gave one, Your Honor. I'm, I'll get to that, but let me finish what I was saying. But let me give you another example. I was a law clerk on the D.C. Circuit, as I say in the printed materials, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the newest judge on the circuit. 
and I worked with her. I was a court law clerk, a position that no longer exists, and I worked with different judges. And I worked with her on a case in which I wrote a bench memo saying the government should lose and the district court's decision in favor of the government should be reversed. And she called me and she said, I don't agree with you. I'm going to vote to affirm because I think this is committed to agency discretion. At oral argument, the lawyer for the government um, got up and was promptly asked by Judge Ginsburg, is it the thrust of your argument that this issue is committed to agency discretion? Oh, no, Your Honor, I would never say that. <laughs> Reverse per curia. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's that, that one experience, and that lawyer subsequently became a judge herself, but it's that one experience that has led me to think ever since about how often cases can be lost in oral argument. And there are a lot of ways to lose them. Mm -hmm. A theory with no limits is another one. Uh, a theory that says not only do I have to win this case, but everybody who is in a different situation has to win every case that's in any way similar. That can be a good way to alienate the justices or judges or that you're appearing before. Yeah, like, or another way of saying what Roy's saying, I insisting that the implications of your position will result in not just everybody down the chain of reasoning winning, but winning in absurd situations. You know, if that's if, if you can't convince them that your position isn't going to lead to those kinds of results, you're going to have a big problem. So and yet, there's the mirror image problem as yeah. well. Yeah. You want to yes, talk about it? Yes, exactly. I mean, one huge problem is when you can't articulate any limiting principle that will that will cabin the implications of the decision. And one thing you see over and over and over, because it really is very hard. Um, is, you know, the justices will ask, ask someone a question that calls for them to articulate such a principle, and they will continue not really answering and just saying, you know, essentially, well, this case is not like that, or, you know, other, otherwise evading the question, and that is never a helpful thing. And that happened in Merritt v. FTI, a bankruptcy case heard yeah. and decided this term in which the lawyer was asked hypothetical questions that varied from his facts and his answer was always the court can deal with that issue when and if it arises. Very bad way to answer the questions and it, even if he had limiting principles to his theory, it implied that he didn't have limiting principles and he just was trying to avoid all the hard questions which is a very bad way to argue a case. But one thing about this point that Roy made, which I agree with, um, is that there's, it's one thing to say that and be conscious of it, it, but you can't actually approach oral argument thinking that way. You can't, like, oral argument, you can't go in and, like, play four corners offense, you know, to use a basketball metaphor. I mean, maybe in very rare instances you can do that, but in general, they can't, you can't approach it that way. You have to approach it from a, you know, from a, you have to have your head in the space that, you know, I need to go in there and win this, you know, I mean, and so, because uh, otherwise you're not going to speak with, the, you're not going to convey the kind of conviction and, right. um, and a sense of solidity of your position that you need to, to be persuasive. And so you have to hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time, and which is what yes. makes it kind of a tricky thing. Yeah, no, you have yeah. to be a, 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 a braggadocious, swaggering gladiator when you walk into oral argument. And then you have to come down from it so you're not an asshole afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, don't know that that I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, maybe as a woman I think about these things differently. I don't know that I entirely agree with that characterization. Um, maybe but not the braggadocious part. You have to believe you're right. Yeah. And you have to show them that you believe you're right. Because if you don't believe you're right, they won't believe you're right. <laughs> All right, well, thank you panelists, that was wonderful. Thank you.